So, hello and good morning. Lovely to have you here. Tabea, we are almost 40 people from uh, more or less around Switzerland. Hello, welcome. Amazing. <laughs> I just showed my people in the breakout session, I showed them my view and they were very jealous. You would like to share with, with all of us so we all can be jealous? Uh, let's do that because we're going to be very creative right now. I'll first show you. So I'm in Tel Aviv for those who don't know. But uh, I'm in quarantine because I was in Switzerland, so. Oh my God. Oh. Wow. Oh no. And the city. Oh, we miss it so much. I do. <laughs> Can you please stop your video? We don't want to see that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, at the moment, I can only enjoy it from my balcony as well because of these crazy restrictions. But anyway. So, Tabea, I'm so happy to have you with us. I was looking forward a lot to talk to you. And uh, we said it's going to be kind of an interview. So, dear participants, if you have any questions, please write in the chat. Or even in the end, you can uh, talk yourself to Tabea. We will open the microphone. That's fantastic. So, um, Tabea, maybe just uh, we start with you. Where, where, who are you? Where are you from? Uh, what was your upbringing like? Yeah, I always say whenever somebody asks me who I'm from, it's usually usually people just give you a one word sentence, um, like whatever. But for me, it's I was born and raised in Papua New Guinea, which is an island above Australia, for those who don't know. Um, and then moved to Switzerland when I was uh, 16, did all my uh, training, apprenticeship there, was there for almost 20 years. I don't know how I survived, <laughs> but I did. And now we're in Tel Aviv, Israel since, well, we're in our seventh year of being here. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. So tell me about your journey. Like, why did you move from... Um, Switzerland to Tel Aviv? Um, it's actually a long story and I think I'll start right at the beginning. Um, it was actually when I when I had my kids and I didn't go back to work full-time or, or part-time because it was it was not very it just didn't work out to go part-time back to work but I was still very um, I was just looking for more to do than just being a stay-at-home mum so I started to volunteer in several organizations that were doing anything from just humanitarian, humanitarian like social organizations, nonprofits and things. And that's actually when I came across uh, human trafficking and the whole uh, problem of, yeah, it even just even in Zurich, just seeing all those girls, men, uh, transgenders being exploited for <clears throat> reasons they did not even know that they got themselves into and when I faced the facts and the more I just realized that these people don't choose it um, in the sense of really having a choice they're forced into it because of uh, reasons for where they're coming from um, and so the more I got involved and the more I actually started to meet these people who are just real people with real problems, they all told me we don't need pity, we need jobs. Because we got ourselves into this, we got ourselves into prostitution without really knowing what we were getting ourselves into. And, um, and now we actually just need another job, but who will offer us a job with the past that we have? So just, that's just really, summarizing it very briefly of course there's way more to it how I actually then really got to have these conversations with the people but I don't know you can either ask the question or yeah we'll go there later or not but that whole I just that that phrase resonated within me just we don't need pity we need jobs and there were so many people helping these um, exploited people out of prostitution but they were not getting jobs because they're so traumatized and 
and they usually have to are sent back to their countries or whatever but nobody was really offer, offering the holistic solution of a job and i think we all know that having a purpose in life and getting up to a job that you're proud of um, is just is just so it adds so much value to you that you can work through a lot of uh, trauma you can work through a lot of things especially these people who only know a job as being exploited used as a commodity treated uh, abused mistreated abused um, they nobody believes in them anymore and so that all led to us actually why i say us is i kept um talking to my husband about it who who was just he just saw my passion for these people and um and we just started to pursue the dream of creating a social business to employ these people something creative something um in just to be able to offer them jobs and um just being in Switzerland, we just always felt like it would be very, very difficult because I think I would still be studying if I'd be in Switzerland. And people always say, why did you go to Israel? You're not Jewish. Um, what brought you to Tel Aviv? And I think it was just the more we talked about it with friends and people around us. And I think that's one of the keys of just finding your passion and purpose is the more you talk about it with the right people um, who can really sur surround you with that and, and actually support you in the dreams you have, the more the pointers just showed to Tel Aviv as a very innovative um, startup nation, a place where where you can just people celebrate the fact that you come with very innovative ideas. And also, I think it was just destiny. We just felt our hearts were just in Tel Aviv. My husband came here first and he was just going, I just I think this is our city. And he came back. He came alone and he said, I think we need to move to Tel Aviv. And I first thought he was crazy. Um, but then the more we just kept pursuing that, the thought, the more doors opened. And then we found ourselves in Tel Aviv, first writing a um, business plan for this social startup, uh, networking, and um, just doing everything it takes to actually then build a business. Wow. I mean, uh, I live in Zurich and I can say that I have a, let's say, a more or less a working network, but to come to a city you don't know, like no person, uh, I'm sure you, or I assume you didn't know the language even and, and the culture and this screaming all the time around and yalla yalla bye and everything. So, um, I mean, that that's about creative mornings, like how, what, how creative uh, did you have uh, to be to uh, work on this plan? And w with who did you talk about it? And where did you find the money in the end? Yeah, I think it's really the key is really the out of out of the box thinking. And I think Tel Aviv is really out of the box. It's a nation that I always say Tel Aviv because Israel, there are so many different parts. And if you talk Jerusalem, it's a completely different culture. So I always say I'm in Tel Aviv. I'm in Israel, but I'm in Tel Aviv because it's just it's just a different city. And um, I think you can compare it with the Miami of America or Los Angeles, just where so many, it's so cross-cultural. So many um, people come here that it's very, very international. And um, and as I said before, they celebrate innovation and they really, really encourage you to, to actually make mistakes because mistakes are not mistakes in, in themselves, they're teachers. And, and that was just the mentality we met. I mean, they just, everyone said, you just go for it. And we thought, wow, it's so different than in Switzerland. You have to have the plan and you have to have the solution before you have the problem. Here, you really have to have the problem and then it'll, you'll definitely find a solution. And if you don't find one, then just work on something else in the problem. And I think that mentality just encouraged us. And again, the networking people are very much, if you tell somebody about your idea, and I've got obviously the right people. And I mean, we look for the people in the field. Um, and I think that's another thing that Israelis are so good at. They connect you. Nobody's a threat. It's always, oh, in, in Hebrew, it's like achi, which means my brother. And, and, and that's how they talk to you. Oh, my achi will be able to tell you. It's not his, his biological brother, but it's just his friend who's doing something in the field. And then he'll connect you to that person. And, and that's actually how it started. I mean, we moved to an area, we had no clue where we were moving to. And um, 
and the our kids we threw them right into hebrew school we thought let's just go all in i think that's another key just always all in um because you can't lose if you go all in and otherwise it's as israelis say if it's a mistake then just try something else and so we moved um to an area where uh apparently there were a lot of educated people it was close to the university and a lot of people were somewhere in um either the united nations working or whatever and uh my daughter went to to a kindergarten where because she spoke english and swiss german but english helped her a lot obviously before she then was able to speak hebrew but there was another girl there who spoke english and um, this other girl's grandmother, she was, um, she worked for the United Nations in the head, and she was the head of human trafficking department. And so, I mean, just what are the odds that you move to a place where, where they then just, she was able to connect us with all the right people to actually even find the victims to then to who we wanted to employ. And so that led to the next connection and the next connection. And it's, and again, it's that out of the box thinking. It's not, oh my goodness, this is impossible. And how will I ever start? It's just in the going that we were shown the way. It was just, just move and the doors will open. And if they don't open, it's a wrong, it's it's not your door. And um, and so that's literally how we went about it. We just moved and and the doors opened. And the ones that closed, we knew they were not the right ones. And so we built a um we first wrote the business plan with the idea we had the idea of doing something in the upcycling um field because we just thought it was a it was a beautiful metaphor for the people that we wanted to employ um old and broken and um that like as in upcycling you take something old and broken something people throw away something people discard some something people just you know say you can't use them anymore and then you make something new and beautiful. And that's just like the people we work with, um, they, they're discarded, they're treated as commodities, as products. They've been so used, uh, nobody wants to use them anymore, throw them out, and then we give them new hope and a new future. And so we started by first taking uh, very old pallets. I mean, in Europe, that was a thing right then. And we did research here to see if uh, it, would, it would sell. Um, and that's again a very great example of where we started. We started with pallet furniture, creating beautiful, unique pieces. But then the market was was pretty quickly. We just kind of hit a dead end, and then we just moved on to the next thing because in that time people got, got to know about us, and we worked with a lot of volunteers who came from overseas. And then we had one friend who was uh, a kite surfer, but also a designer. She used to also um, sew. Uh, yacht sails and things and she started to repair kite surfing sails and she said why don't you make bags out of them so the uh, idea of the business we now actually lead came from a friend and she brought us the whole idea the concept she brought us the kite surf uh, the first few um, kite surfing sails and then we just started to create bags and then that was the journey and it was just moving from there and and when was that maybe i can show a picture of you i love this picture um do you see it all i think it's such a fantastic picture maybe you want to tell us more because you were talking about um kite surfing so did you already kite surf yourself when you started it or was it then yeah so you're in the community yeah. yeah yeah so i already i already was kite surfing then um but i yeah, and we did experience exactly that, that, you know, your kite breaks, but it's still great material and either you can fix it or you can't. And so um, when our friend then said, you know, you've got kite surfing is huge here in Israel. There's a very, very big community of kite surfers and um, they're very much into you use your sail till it's broken. And then, and then they just love the idea of donating their kite. So that's how it works. So we started to build relationships with the kite surfing community here we told them about us we said instead of throwing your kite away we'll give it a second wind and we called it uh, like our slogan was second wind for kites and people because we're giving them a second chance a second wind as well and um so the kite surf community donates their old kites to us we make them a bag out of their kite or out of the kites that we already have. Now it's grown much bigger. So it's not as personal as it was in the beginning. We, we literally made kites 
um, kite bags for the kite surfer who donated his kite out of his own kite. And um, we still do that for very big donors or for companies who have kite surf schools here and who really want their kites to be um, turned into bags and they donate a lot of kites. So they donate kites, they get a bag, um, as you can see in the picture here. And, and so it's a full circle uh, and their kite is not somewhere rotting away, but it's actually being turned into a beautiful new bag. And we only take the, the, the beautiful pieces. It's a bit like for those of you who are in Switzerland, I mean, I'm sure you're very aware of the brand Freitag. It's very similar to that just not out of um, uh, truck canvases, but um, out of kite surf sails. And now we've moved on to yacht sails as well. We have a whole collection of yacht sail bags. They're all white, um, beautiful, beautiful canvas, very, very strong. Uh, we make uh, gym bags, we make every bag, you name it. Um, and we just keep developing it uh, according to the demand of customers. We have, um, we also do corporate branding for big companies who want to make an impact, who want to um, gift their employees, and then we co-brand it with their brand. We just move with whatever and just try to be as innovative as we can be to keep going. And um, yeah. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I wonder a bit, like, would you like to talk about your uh, workers? Like um, when you meet, or oh, how do you meet them? And, and where do you meet them? And how do you um, uh, überzeugen them to, uh, to come and work? And like, how is this? Uh... <laughs> Sophie's laughing. <laughs> how do you convince them? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm tired, I'm sorry. <laughs> so how do you convince them to work with you, well, maybe you can tell us a bit more uh, um, about that. Yeah, so that's actually what I shared before, how we just came here and first actually networked with the right people. Again, when we met this person who was able to connect us with all the, the shelters that work with human trafficking victims, um, also those who uh, were already in the country, but just forced prostitution. Uh, there's a difference between actual human trafficking victims and forced prostitution, but they all have one thing in common. They were all forced into what they were doing. And so all of these people, if you, that we, we followed, um, uh, we actually did a study with an institution here that um, where, they, where they did a, <clears throat> a survey and they asked everyone in forced prostitution if they would have the option to opt out if they wanted to quit what they were doing and 76 percent of them said that they wanted out and they said that um who were who were surveyed i mean those who i met personally they all wanted out but just those who were surveyed 76 percent of them wanted out but they all said because of lack of education and fear of not being able to reintegrate they kind of just kept in the numbing cycle because they're all on drugs and alcohol uh, when they're doing what they're doing and so they all said we can't like we want out but we can't so then in, the more the survey went on and just asking all the people what their biggest barriers and fears are was really the lack of education and the lack of being able to present anything that they've done in the past and also the trauma. And so we started to just connect with uh, shelters here. I volunteered for two years, um, first being in Israel with a shelter and just finding out, uh, you know, where the problems are. We work with social workers who, and that's also who we then employed. We employed a social worker to be able to deal with the people that we employ. And then we just, we have them referred to us from the shelters. We don't go onto the streets and ask people, do you want to work for us? And they come straight to us It's or, or into brothels. That would not work. So they are first rescued out. They're first um, in a one or two year program of the shelter, first getting clean of drugs and alcohol, uh, working through first trauma, and then the shelters and because of the big networking that we did at the very beginning, that was really part of was actually the main part of building the business was really working with the shelters whom we wanted the victims from and just really finding out, yeah, how can we actually create a work environment that these people will last. 
this is not your normal job you go to. We try and treat it as a, as a normal job for them. And we're a normal business in that sense. And we know where they're coming from, but we don't, we don't, um, we still, we still have that patience and the endurance to just say, okay, you know, they first have to learn to, to actually do the, do the whole job. It's basically like an apprenticeship with, with, um, with, people who have very 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 high traumas so they but, but but again we only take them when they're clean um of drugs and alcohol and when they can actually already identify in the shelters these people are very creative or these people would love to do that and then they come to us for a normal job interview and we tell them what what the, what is what you know what they can expect um what a training looks like and um, and the great thing is in our business is it's so creative and people can come um, and basically start on a kindergarten level. I don't want to you know put them down to the level of kindergarten, but the fact is the actual fact is that a lot of these people have never been to school, and so they don't even know how to cut. It's crazy, but it really is a bit like a kindergarten. So they can come, and the great thing is they can take an old kite and they can wash it, you know, it's dirty, it might be full of sand, whatever. And that might be their first few, you know, jobs, just washing kites, um, cutting them open. It's a bit like, I always say, it's like filleting a fish, um, really just knowing exactly where to cut. And even that takes a lot of uh, know-how to know how to open a kite to use it to a max. And so they can start by doing that. Somebody else will come in and we'll see right away. She has talent right away. She has the concentration to start to get her right into sewing. So she'll already, you know, learn to sew. And we have a seamstress, a professional seamstress on board. We have a social worker who can, you know, identify traumas that are, that are triggered or whatever. They have to learn to deal with, um, with a bit of pressure, with team. Um, we, we always share a common meal at lunch together. We cook. We, um, we, have, we have a sales and marketing person who's there. Uh, so we, we have a few uh, people in our business who are professional in their field and all of the other employees are really from the past, um, from, from, from uh, forced prostitution. Okay. I have already a lot of questions in the chat. So uh, let's start. Frank is asking, what kind of resistance have you met in your journey? How did you handle it? And can you give us examples, please? Thank you, Frank, for asking that. So, Tabea, what was kind, what kind of resistance did you? Well, the first, the first resistance we actually got was um, even from the shelters themselves referring the victims to us. They said this will not work because you are only employing victims, and they're all kind of it's they're all coming from the same past and if they're all together in a room and everyone knows that this is where they're coming from that they will not cope with that and um and it, it proved wrong because um yes you know there are a few uh, uh, things that happen where you realize oh wow you know there are a lot of fights among the girls but in the, in the end they always solve it themselves and um even just rivalry, because that seems to be quite a problem in that field and just uh, jealousy and things like that. If somebody moves on faster or somebody can sew, uh, the other person is still washing kites or just things like that. And just, they said, how do you want to create a business that, um, that will even work with, with basically employing losers? And, um, and that did prove very difficult, but I think the setup we had was, was good because we also founded a nonprofit. And with that, we raise, we raise funds and that feeds into the social business. And from day one, we pay them a salary so that they are not tempted to go back to where they came from. Um, and also we, we, we met a lot of resistance along the way, just learning from our own mistakes. Um, even from the girls themselves, what we realize very quickly is they can't deal with pressure. So the whole um, business effect of saying we have to sell bags so that we can actually make it so we don't have to fundraise as much because we, we did not want to re-victimize our people because so many people who heard about our story they look at the bag and it's expensive, it's handmade, it's unique, it's one of a kind, it's, 
it's a lot of hours are put into that. So that's what you calculate when you make the end price. And people are just looking at the bag and they say, well, wait a minute, it's recycled, upcycled. Um, it's been completely used and this is the money you want for it. And then you have to start explaining and we didn't want to constantly have to explain or justify our price because we've just forgotten what things cost. Um, people are so used to just ordering on Alibaba China somewhere, but they don't, you don't know who made it. And um, so we can guarantee who made it and we can say it's fair. And I think people are becoming more aware of that, but it's something that was also one big resistance we faced was people are like, I'm not paying $150 for your backpack that is recycled. Um, and, and we just said, you've forgotten that if you, if you can buy something cheap, somebody else is paying the price. And, um, and so that was another thing we, we really had to, it, we struggled with a lot because people just then want to hear the whole story. And we always said, we don't always want to tell the story of our people because otherwise you keep re-victimizing them. And it's like, oh, oh, this poor person made this bag and I'll buy it and I'm just doing good. And we want people to buy the bag because it's just amazing. It's an amazing product and everybody who has it knows it. But, um, but that's something that we, we're still trying to figure out how we can best do our marketing that we don't always have to tell the story. But again, it's something that animates people to buy because they're like, this is brilliant, you know, but it's just, so that's something we, we're still kind of finding our way. Okay. I hope I've answered the question. Yes, you said the girls. Um, so you work uh, mainly with the female people. Um, yeah, we, we do we do have one guy he left that's why it's just the girls right now but uh, we did we did have two guys and we have uh, two transgenders. So um, at the moment they're all they're all uh, girls. Okay. Then women, I should say women. <laughs> so um, Sophie is asking how long do you do your employees usually stay with your company? And if they leave, are they able to get a job in the regular market? Um, yeah, that's the goal. So we've only been up and running for actual, we've been here for six and a half years, but we've actually only been running uh, our business for, I think it's just three years now. And so we have a few who are still with us from the very beginning. They did the whole journey with us, which is really, really amazing to see the difference. And um, we have already had uh, a few su successfully passed through. One of them went on to study. One of them, uh, the, the, the one male that we had, he went on to open his own little fashion studio. Wow. Um, unfortunately, COVID hit him very hard. And so, um, but it's awesome. He, he then tapped on our door again and asked if he could come back to work for us. So that's actually an amazing story as well to know that he really wanted to come back. And we're going to just encourage, we're going to try and get him through this COVID um, season. And then hopefully he'll be able to fly freely again and just continue his fashion label. Um, we had a few who went back to, uh, or not back, but just went to work in shops, you know, as um, uh, uh, just either filling up in uh, pharmacies, you know, filling up the counters or working at um at the counter, just the checkout or just things like that. Very simple jobs. Um, and some of them, we, at the very, very beginning, when we started with the pallet furniture, we had a lot of uh, guys, especially young, young men who were in uh, forced prostitution. And uh, unfortunately, the, those, um, those guys were all in a, they, they, they were actually then in the end, they ended up in prison because they were also part of a, a crime. So we have a few cases that were sad to see them go. But um, at the end of the day, I always say, never, never underestimate the impact you make in a certain period of their life. And I think we were always able to just add value and, and give them hope that there's more to life than just what they experienced in the past. Um, now for the new year 2021, we are actually just starting into a very, very exciting new chapter. COVID hit us hard on sales, but it actually helped us in developing the social part of our business more. And we were able to reach a lot of people in the government that we were trying to reach to actually become an officially 
um, recognized um, kind of like an education spot that they can they can uh, place more people in our business and we can do a proper education with the certificate for them not only that people then stay with us uh, with Kite Pride but can move on so we're actually expanding and we're employing two more social workers and one human resource person who so it'll be really like an apprenticeship with us where they do um, like a training and then while they're training with us and we're giving them different courses, language, math, whatever, just uh, things that just will help them. And then they can be placed in other uh, businesses. So the government has just agreed. We, we were able to reach all the people we had to and we've been trying to reach for so long. And uh, they will, they now uh, agreed to a joint venture where they're meeting our budget with 50% which means that they will pay the people that they will place with us. They will pay them the salary and we will actually educate them. So we're going to be able to, in the next three years, um, rehabilitate over a hundred people. And that's, that's huge because we've only been able to take about 10 people um, at a time because we pay them from day one, as I said, and we fundraised everything ourselves and we never had support from the government. Wow, that's amazing. So congratulations on that. I have yeah. so many questions. I will pick two Swiss questions. <laughs> One question is, what was the time um, Miriam is asking? I just lost it, but uh, it, the question was like, ah, how long did it take you from the idea to the first bag? Um... The idea actually, because it was brought to us from a friend who was kite surfer and designer and seamstress, she already had a few bags. She was not doing this professionally. She was just doing this on the side for friends. She was fixing their kites. And if their kites were not able to be fixed, she just made a bag. And it started with a very simple Ikea bag style. And, um, and so she just brought us that and said, run with it. I'm gonna donate the, 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 the whole idea to you. and um, and she officially gave us the whole idea. And then we pretty much just started doing it. Like we, we worked with a lot of volunteers. We then, as soon as we had the idea, as soon as we knew we were doing that, we put in our um, newsletter, we're looking for volunteers to come to Israel to help us with um, designing bags out of kite surfing material. And so a lot of people signed up, came, you can come for three months without a visa to Israel. And that's pretty much how we worked. We didn't work with local people because of the language at the beginning. So a lot of international volunteers came and then it was, that was basically our R&D. Volunteers coming, throwing in ideas, donating their time um, and just, you know, giving us new ideas. And every time somebody came, they developed a product. It was amazing. It was amazing to see. And we also did one um, creative uh, night where we actually then worked with local Israelis uh, designers and it was like a competition to to it was we called it a makeathon. Um, it's a bit like the hackathons in the IT area, but we called it a makeathon. And um, the the whole they worked through the whole night, 24 hours of just designing. And then we we had um, three three winners, and then we took those products and developed them. So just trying to be innovative as uh, as we went, but it was. Pretty much the idea was brought to us and in the same week we produced, but uh, we didn't sell in the same week. <laughs> okay, wow, that sounds amazing um, and so inspiring. So what we have here in the chat is like uh, Justin, Justine, <laughs> she's writing order a bag before Sunday and they will arrive in time for Christmas. That was a commercial break. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I mean, like you said, there are different um, opportunities or um, yet yeah, how we could help or how, um, how people can contribute to it. Maybe you can tell us on that, like we could bring kites if we were kite surfers or what, volunteer, or maybe you just can um, tell us more about the possibilities, how we could help the um, organization. 
Yeah, it's definitely spreading the word. And when you buy a bag, you have something and people ask you, where's that bag from? Because they're so unique. They're so colorful. They're so, they're so controversy to everybody dressing in black in Switzerland. I was just there and thinking, everyone's just in black. And here I came with my bright yellow jacket and my bright kite pride bag. And people just spot you on the train. And, um, and you strike up a conversation with the bag it's usually that um, and so that definitely helps us if you order a bag um, but also uh, you can um, we actually have a new general importer in Switzerland or in Europe and the bags would arrive if you'd order it it's um, I can send the link through and then you can send it to everybody what is it Fonti um, shop yeah exactly Fonti shop yeah okay great yeah so Fonti shop .ch slash kite pride for those in Switzerland or in Germany, it's DE. Anyway, um, they have a lot of our products uh, and they just keep ordering. They're our general importer. From here, it might take a bit longer because um, post takes a bit, takes a while and you pay taxes, unfortunately. That's why we were really looking for a solution for a general importer. And um, there are a few shops. You, I think you should all know the Changemaker shop. Changemaker is in Basel, in Zurich. Uh, they have our bags since, uh, I think, one or two years. Just one of them, which is the drawstring bag, very simple. Uh, we make them in special Swiss colors, <laughs> black and white, or just very sub subtle colors. Um, and they're selling them like crazy. That's amazing. And, um, and then we even have the opportunity that you can actually sponsor an employee um, where people can actually donate a 30 francs a month for an employee so that we can employ more people and then you get a bag for becoming a sponsor of an employee and it's really spreading the word telling people like big companies uh, if you're looking for very exclusive corporate gifts uh, because of COVID we also make masks uh, not out of kites but they are a favorite we are constantly sold out um, this product, the mask, we developed also with a designer and we make it out of 100% um, certified um, Ökotex uh, cotton, Baumwolle. So it's very, it's certified Baumwolle and it's breathable. It's four layers. We have a little um, thing in there that you can even put a filter in and they are the burner I mean people are just we're constantly sold out <laughs> so that's the thing and they're only 1490 so I always say you can always buy a mask and wear it and people are like where is it from people have to wear masks now who would have thought but uh yeah so we joined that that uh train as well of of masks and um yeah just buy a product Wow, Tabea, we have so many questions, but we're coming to an end. It's almost nine o'clock. Um, I'm so thankful um, that you inspired us here. Um, of course, I will try not to wear any more that much black. I will start today with my sweater. Um, what just stayed for me um, is like your, your spirit that you say like you have to go all in. Um, if you want something, I mean, even we in Zurich that we know the area, we know the culture and everything, we should like learn to go all in to be creative and, and to, um, to do something new. And uh, yeah, we should use our network. So I encourage you, dear Creative Mornings people, use us, your Creative Mornings network. It's so important. Um, and um, yeah, like you mentioned the survey. So it's not only like, uh, I have a great idea and maybe we should just do like something new. I think it's really to find out where's the problem? What's the problem? Talk to the people and uh, listen, listen a lot to their problems. And maybe if they tell you something like um, they will never gonna work with you, maybe you can prove it better. Um, so I think that's that's super important. And what made really goosebumps for me was the, the fact that you say, if you buy cheap, someone else is paying the price. And I would like to uh, leave that message for all of us uh, for Christmas, 
to rethink um, this crazy buying uh, attitude that, that we have. Me too, I'm not excluding myself. I just want, um, yeah, to give you that as a message for today for, from Creative Mornings. And I want to thank you so much, um, Tabea, for, for coming uh, to this event. I hope one day maybe we'll have an in-person event in, uh, in Zurich too, where you can join us. That would be a dream for me that all the virtual uh, speakers would come to a, to a Zurich event. So thank you very much. I would like you to stay here with us if you want uh, for like four or five more minutes because then we're all heading to our home offices, hurrying, <laughs> starting to work. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you so much, Tobia. Litraot uh, from Zurich <laughs> with lots of love. Um, yeah, and I'm sure if people want to, to stay in touch with you, they can write you um, through uh, Kite Pride. Um, yeah. Are, is there something more you, you would like to say? No, you can just uh, info at kitepride.com, kitepride.com. I'm sure all the links were there. You can find out, follow us on Instagram, um, see what we're up to, and uh, would love to e-meet anybody of you. Or if you're ever in Tel Aviv, we also have a physical shop. Be sure to pop in whenever these crazy times are over. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're just... Um, and, and, and just as I just want to double up with what you said, actually, just uh, I think that's something that the Israelis are so good at. I think in Switzerland, the culture is often um, everybody's just doing their own thing and not talking about it for fear of losing the idea of having somebody steal the idea. It might happen, but who cares? It's almost like people here are there's 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 just streets of just lights. There's just streets of just furniture. There's streets of just bicycle shops. And if you go to the one guy, he'll say, ah, I don't have time now. I don't really feel like changing your tire. Go to the guy next to me. And it's just it's just the whole attitude of whatever let's just talk about it let's see what is possible i'll connect you with the right people and it's never a threat and so i just want to encourage you guys share your ideas if somebody steals it so what they stole it you know where it came from um you know it's just we don't have to care too much about protecting things so much it's the more you share and the more you actually open the more it expands if we wouldn't have talked about it if we would have not have invited volunteers into our life and I always say, I always make a point. I don't design the bags. They're all, you know, somebody else did it. I'm just, I'm just executing what people have just poured into this business. And, um, and we just keep the vision clear. And, and the more you allow creative people into your life, the, the more colorful it gets. And um, yeah, so just keep creating. Wow. Thank you so much, Tabea. So, um... Are we still here, all of you guys? <laughs> so thank you so much for being with us um, for this in very inspiring and for me also very touching morning. Um, as you know, uh, this creative morning year uh, was also difficult and it's coming to an end. Um, and I would like to try something new with you guys um, to uh, kind of, um, uh, tickle your and my uh, energy. So I prepared a short creative warnings quiz that we try to take now. Um, for that, I will use my quiz music. Can you hear it? Okay, so I will start now with the first question. You have like five questions. When was Creative Mornings founded? Then we have, what was the second chapter founded after New York? How many years the current team is voozling around in Zurich? 
what very famous person attended once a creative mornings in Los Angeles? Oh my God. Then at what location we had already a creative morning Zurich event? What was the maximum number of attendees we had at a Creative Mornings event? And what will you enjoy most when we will meet again in person? Okay, I can see numbers are going crazy here. <laughs> So let's hear this. This is my fairy bringing in the results. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if that works. Yeah, it works. Okay. So I will uh, share with you the results. Do you see them? Okay. So when was Creative Mornings founded? 2008. Yay, you're right. Perfect. What was the second chapter founded after New York? Oh my God, Los Angeles, Zurich and Berlin. I can probably say it was Zurich, yay. It was not me then, but it was Zurich, um, yeah. So how many years uh, the current team is woozling around? It's four years, I see you're really pros, that's fantastic. And what famous person attended once a creative morning in Los Angeles? Oh, it wasn't Iris Apfel and it wasn't Jim Jarmusch, it was Moby. And if you want to see it, you can uh, find it in the speeches that we have. It's a really funny talk because he's sitting on a chair like a king, like in a it's crazy location. And he forgot all his notes at home. So he just starts to talk random things and it's really, you, you, you will enjoy it. Um, yeah, at what location we had already a Creative Mornings. It was in a synagogue, that's right. It was with Thomas Meyer, the author of um, Wolkenbruch's Wunderliche Reise in die Arme einer Schickse. And the maximum number we had at the Creative Mornings was 210, it was in October with um, Sebastian Kernbach. Um, that was crazy and insane. And we were scared that the breakout rooms will collapse, but they didn't, so way. And the last question, the very important question is, what will you enjoy most when, that's a typo, we will meet again in person. Oh, see again faces and smiles. That's so true. Um, unfortunately, I just received yesterday the email uh, that Creative Mornings will remain virtual um, until uh, June for minimum. So uh, yeah, it will stay like that. The plus is we can team up with Basel and we can think of teaming up with more chapters I encourage you also to visit um, to visit other creative mornings. I think to this morning we have like 38 different talks. You can watch either the video or attend um, different cities. I think it's so cool. Uh, I joined the birthday party of a creative morning and I don't remember, but it was uh, it was amazing to feel the spirit of the other um, places. So to um, close this morning, this very last creative morning of the year, I um, would like uh, to play some music. Um, if you feel like uh, move with us, dance with us, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being uh, with us. Um, take the spirit, take the um, initiatives, um, enjoy your time, stay healthy. And if you want to say something in the chat, just stay with us for two or three more minutes. And we have one minute to go. We're so Swiss, I love it. So goodbye to all of you and thank you very much.